In book 21 of the Odyssey, Odysseus has made it home to Ithaca after 20 years of being away. When he returns to his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus, he realizes that his house has been overrun and taken over by 100 suitors. These suitors were rich men who were attempting to marry Penelope in Odysseus's absence. Odysseus doesn't reveal his identity upon returning to Ithaca. He disguises himself as an old poor beggar and enters his home. His son Telemachus is aware of who he is, but his wife Penelope is not. And Penelope's been frustrated and sad because her husband's been gone so long. And she challenges the suitors to a contest. They have to string one of Odysseus's bows, which is an extremely hard task, and then shoot an arrow successfully into 12 holes on the handle of axe heads. And that's what's in the picture that you see above. Now, Odysseus gets the opportunity to compete in this contest. And again, he's an old beggar, and he actually wins. He's the only one out of all the men in the hall that wins the contest. And book 22 is going to pick up after this contest has been completed. Now, Odysseus was mocked by these suitors, and completely, completely disrespected. They've also been in his house a good 15 or 20 years, raiding all of his food, bothering his wife, insulting his son. So book 22 is going to show how Odysseus is going to get rid of these suitors. When book 21 ends, he has them all locked into the hall. There's no escape. And he has a plan with his son. And that is where book 22 will pick up. A few other important points about book 21 that you should be aware of is that, again, the suitors do not know that this is Odysseus because he has disguised himself as a poor beggar. And two of the most rude and disrespectful suitors are Antinous and Eurymachus. And you'll see in book 22, when we begin reading that, that Odysseus has a special plan for Antinous and Eurymachus, as well as the other men who have been living in his home. Book 22, Death in the Great Hall. Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest, or slyest, fighter of the islands leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver and spoke to the crowd, and a quiver is the holder that, an ar that arrows would be kept in. So much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. He drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous. Just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed or engraved, two-handled, golden, the cup was in his fingers, the wine was even at his lips, and did he even dream of death? How could he? In that revelry, that festivity, amid, among, his throng or group of friends, who would imagine a single foe, an enemy, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him in darkness on his eyes? Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up to the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, or blood dripping from his nose, a river of mortal red, 
and one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and meat to soak in dusty blood. So here, Odysseus, who's again still dressed as a beggar, has just picked up his bow and arrow and shot an arrow through the throat of Antinous, one of the suitors or men who are trying to pursue Odysseus's wife. And the other suitors in the room think this is a crazy killer, a murderer. This poor man has just killed a very rich, powerful man. So you're going to hear their reaction to the death of Antinous. Now as they craned to see their champion where he lay, the suitors jostled or moved around in uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly they turned and scanned the walls in the long room for arms, but not a shield, not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. Foul to shoot a man! That was your last shot. Your own throat will be slit for this. Our finest lad or man is down. You killed the best on Ithaca. Buzzards will tear out your eyes. For they imagined, as they wished, that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools not to comprehend that they were already in the grip of death. So here... The authors or the narrators making a note that these suitors are mocking Odysseus, dressed as a beggar, and not seeing that they're his next victims. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder. You raided my house twisted my maids to serve your beds. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. So at last Odysseus reveals his true identity and announces that he plans to kill all of the suitors. And you want to take note of the reasons why he gives for killing them. As they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, their stomachs, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hideaway from death. So you can imagine the suitors are trapped in this hall and they know they're about to die. They're so incredibly scared. Eurymachus, who is another one of the kind of top, most powerful suitors, speaks up here. Eurymachus alone could speak. He said, If you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside. But here he lies, dead, the man who caused all of them. Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronian had denied him as king of Ithaca. For that he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. But Antinous is dead now and has his portion. Spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution, we'll repay of wine and meat consumed. And add each one a tithe, the tax of twenty oxen, the gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. So you want to think about and review these lines. What is Eurymachus' strategy here? How is he trying to save his, himself in the lives of his lives of his men? Odysseus glowered under his black brows and said, Not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house. Fight your way out. 
or run for it if you think you'll escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by or survives, sneaks away. They felt their knees fail in their hearts, but heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying them. So Odysseus has just threatened all of the men that they can't bribe him. They're going to die. And Eurymachus is going to rally the men up one last time. He's going to try to boost their morale, get some fight in them. So here is what Eurymachus says to the suitors that are locked in this room facing death. Friends, he said, the man is implacable. Impossible to soothe, completely unforgiving. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big door stone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone, rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, We'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot, soon shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke, a broad sword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. Then, crying hoarse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow at that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb stuck in his liver. The bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched or bent over and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread and meat were spilt and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed onto the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, both feet kicking out, he downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. So Eurymachus' death is physically painful, um, but it also says that he has revulsion and anguish in his heart. So you may want to think of the mental and emotional pain. Amphinomus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door. But with a spear throw from behind, Telemachus, who was Odysseus's son, hit him between the shoulders, and the lance head drove clear through his chest. He left his feet and fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long, dark spear planted in Amphimius. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword at the moment he bent over. So he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted or stopped, panting out of breath, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and a spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus in his cow hoard. Better to have equipment. So here Telemachus is asking his dad's permission to run into the storage room and get more weapons. So he could be armed, his father could be armed, as well as Eumaeus, who's one of the faithful servants of Odysseus. Said Odysseus, run then while I hold them off with arrows. As long as the arrows last, when all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. So he's giving his son permission to leave, but he's saying, hurry up, because they'll kill me once my arrows run out. You need to come back. Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where the spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war high plumed with flowing manes, and ran back, loaded down, to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slide his bare arm in the buckler strap. The servants armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle, or Odysseus. 
While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies or one of the suitors. But when all barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door and armed. A four-ply shield hard on his shoulder, and a crested helm that's a feathered helmet, horse-tailed, nodding stormy upon his head. Then he took his tough and bronze-shod spears. So once his arrow has run, his arrows have run out, Odysseus puts on full battle armor, um, and it really just kind of shows him as a warrior. The suitors make various unsuccessful attempts to expel or rem remove Odysseus from his post at the door. Athena, the goddess, urges Odysseus on to battle, yet holds back her fullest aid or help, waiting for Odysseus and Telemachus to prove themselves. Six of the suitors attempt an attack on Odysseus, but Athena deflects their arrows. Odysseus and his men seize this opportunity to launch their own attack, and the suitors begin to fall or die. At last, Athena's presence becomes known to all, as the shape of her shield becomes visible above the hall. The suitors, recognizing the intervention or help of the gods on Odysseus's behalf, are frantic to escape, but to no avail, so they don't make it. Odysseus and his men are compared to falcons, who show no mercy to the flocks of birds they pursue and capture. Soon the room is reeking with blood, or stinking with blood. Thus the battle with the suitors comes to an end, and Odysseus prepares himself to meet Penelope. And this is where Book 23 will begin.